Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's time for another interview. Today I am joined by, most people consider her a horror icon. I consider her a action icon. The lovely oh. star of Fraternity Vacation, the girl that should have played the main girl, Miss Kathleen Kinmont. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Now, as the girl, who's the main girl? Cherie Wilson? Um, I, you know, I don't even remember her name. The one they made the bet on. Um, she. That's Cherie, yeah. You know, I mean, Cherie, Cherie J. Wilson, who went on to um, be on that show with uh, uh, the kickboxing guy, Texas Ranger. Oh, Walker. Yeah, yeah, Walker. Well, but she's yeah. like nothing again. The Fraternity Vacation is like one of my favorite, oh. favorite movies since childhood. And I mean, she, it was like they were competing over. She looked like she was 47. I mean, I just did, <laughs> I, I didn't get it. You know, I liked the movie a lot. I just showed yeah. it to my son maybe a few years ago. Oh, my God. <laughs> A few years ago, wait, your son's eleven, from what I from what I know. My son saw Revenge of the Nerds when he was five, and uh, my wife went in the other room and forgot to censor some scenes. So uh, yeah, he was he was much like me. I think at the age of five or six, he just didn't have Cinemax. He had DVD to be exposed to uh, cleavage in films. To boobies, so, yeah. <laughs> Hey, you know, there there's so much sexualization out there right now, and there's so much. Availability for anything. It's this really like the the age of innocence gets ripped off pretty quickly. But um, you know, as long as as long as people aren't aren't getting too absorbed in that kind of stuff, then that's that's fine. But yeah, you know, sexual comedy romps that was all the rage back in the eighties. And now that I'm watching a lot of content with my fifteen year old daughter, I'm realizing. Not much has changed. Maybe the protection on the set has changed more, but there's still just as much, if not way more, nudity on film. Like, I don't know if you've seen Euphoria yet, but that show is, first of all, amazing. I love it. <clears throat> but second of all, it's really, um, really way out there on what they are showing now where it, especially with male, male genitalia you know it used to just be guys butts and now it's full frontal yeah. all over the place yeah i remember the first time i watched game of thrones i was kind of like what the hell is this that you're making me watch and i'm looking at my it's wife and I, was, I was like I, I understand the appeal you're getting from this but this is really not hitting any cylinder here for me <laughs> at least spartacus I mean had lucy lawless in it for god's sakes you know, I, I this is so interesting that we're touching on this immediately because this morning I was witness to a new rap video that's out there. And I am not going to say who the artist, and I use that term very loosely, because you can't unsee some stuff. You know, that's the thing, yeah. right? That's that's the phrase. I can't unsee it now, which to me is like I assault, cornea abuse, <laughs> brain. You just took advantage of my focus on my brain, and that's going to be an imprint because it's so shocking and it's so dehumanizing and so disgusting that I, I, I'm left wondering, what is the message? Why are we, are we, not me, I say not we, but as a species, are we putting this kind of content out on YouTube, A, without a, if you better be 18 kind of thing, or, or private subscription only, or you could, the only way you can get this is by purchasing it with a credit card. But to make it such public access is so shameful. And, and I mean, there's a fine line. And you know what? It's really not even that fine. There's a big wide line from provocative to disgusting pretty much yeah right and i mean you know when you're like hey maybe we should tone this down a little bit and people are like nope we're going nasty 
we're going so off the grid. And there's a responsibility that we have, not just as human beings, but as artists and people that are, but you know, everyone now has like, I have, I can make my own movies here in my own bedroom. I can oh, make yeah. them wherever I feel like it, in my car, on the beach, on the street, in an alley, wherever. But but what has really gotten me so upset, Corey, and I'm sorry I'm going off on such a oh, tangent, no. but like it really means something to me because for somebody who has, you know, really soul searched on doing nudity on film and being someone who's, you know, provocative and sexy and showing that um, emotional, human, natural thing that where we all get naked and we all, you know, are silly and we all have sex and we all do these things eventually, you know. But, like, these days where we've got to be really careful with who we're with, not only just because of virus, but also because of, the sex trafficking, human trafficking pandemic that's also going on in the world. I don't know. That's just, I had a conversation with one of my friends about it today, and I'm like, there's something really off here. Because as far as we've come, we also need to, we need to enlighten. We need to uplift. We need to be thinking in a higher consciousness. And I'm, I was really, really, uh, I'm not even going to give these artists the time of day anymore, but it's just, it's, it's, it's really disappointing. Disappointing to all women of every ethnicity. And yeah, I'm not even going to say what the song is. I'm not going to say who the artists are. I'm not going to say it because I don't want to give them any, any, any press. It's just that we need to be so careful with what we turn our kids on to. But it's out there, so what can you do? <laughs> well, and even back, like, like, uh, like you said, when you would show nudity in the uh, in the eighties, it, it was different. It was like, here's a shot of my boobs. Uh, here's a shot of a guy's ass. It wasn't a girl getting. It wasn't the I spit on your grave remake where five hillbillies are ramming some girl for twenty five minutes. You know, it was. It was I different. agree. Yeah, and you know what? They're making those films. Yeah. They are. They're doing it. They're doing it. And it, here's, you know, it's really interesting about Fraternity Vacation. I'll bring it back to what you were bringing up because that is a fun film. And I appreciate that you thought I should have been the, the lead because, yeah, Shuri had a, had a definite sophistication about her, which made her like that untouchable beauty. You know, me and Barbara Crampton were like, we were the silly girls and we were like goofy. But, you know, the, the lady that was, that played, um, Wendell Tavette's mom, the, uh, the the couple, the older couple. Yeah, I they remember Max my... Wright was the dad. I can't think of the mom's name. Yeah. Right. Well, they asked my mom to play that part, and she had already signed on. She signed on. She said, yeah, sure, I'd love to be in a movie with my daughter. Have fun. I didn't tell her that I was going to be doing a, hey, how are you guys got the cure for herpes? Or, <laughs> you know, and then we do like the big strip tease thing and all that crazy stuff. And, and you know, she didn't know. She didn't know that my agent and I had negotiated all kinds of stuff for all that nudity contract, and and I was freaking out. I'm like, oh, my God, my mom's going to drive down to Palm Springs. She's going to be in this movie. Then she's going to see the movie and not see what I did. And, you know, I was like, I have to drive up to L.A. and tell my mom what I've already shot, you know. So I did. On one of my days off, I drove back to L.A. because I couldn't have that conversation with her on the phone. <laughs> I knew I had to do it with her on pers in person. And that's a, that story should be in the book, actually, but it's not. And maybe for the sequel, somebody wants to pay me to do it. <laughs> we'll see how well this book does. But I I was really terrified. And you know what? My mom said, well, thank you for letting me know that, honey. I really appreciate it. I'm going to pass. I mean, you got paid. Of course. No, of course I got paid. And she would have gotten paid, too. And we would have been in a film together. She would have been in a film with me where I take my clothes off. You know, and she was like, no, no thanks. And that was the 80s. And, you know, it's really interesting because I, I watched this great interview on the red carpet with Melanie Griffith and Dakota. Um, oh, what's her dad's last name? Johnson. Dakota Johnson. Um, they were on the red carpet for her film, you know, the first freaking, you know, the, the movie that she did, the, the franchise film, the, the Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, those movies are terrible. 
Well, you know what? Fine. But I mean, like, they were made and they made a ton of money. Yeah, my wife owns all three of them. Yeah, well, and if you're not into that stuff, you're definitely going to go like, ew, gross, what's the draw? I'm not into that stuff, too, but I was watching them as a mother and daughter on the red carpet, and you know, Melanie said, they asked her, they said, so what do you think of the film? She goes, oh, I can't watch that. No, I can't. And I thought, oh, my God, she's so honest, and she's staying so true to her mother instincts of seeing her daughter being tortured for pleasure. It wasn't the, you know? the content that, that didn't bother me or anything. It was just like, it was uh, to me, I mean, I'm not the target audience. Us, uh, Housewives were the target audience for that film, in my opinion. And it was just, um, I don't know. It was like, to me, it was just like, let's spice up a lifetime movie. I didn't really get the, nothing about it felt erotic. Nothing about it. it bad chemist. I don't know. I just, I would like I always say, but I'm not the target audience for that film. You know, I'll tell you what, I am the target audience for that film, and I didn't like it either. I thought it was cliche. I thought it was um, super uh, exploitive, and nothing about that was erotic. I thought he was, you know, I, I don't really like to bag on people's performances. I just didn't, it's not my cup of tea either. I don't, I, I'm not into, see, see, I've been in a lot of horror films, but I don't really enjoy being scared at all. And maybe that's why I'm a good choice to be an actor in a horror film, because I'm very, very sensitive to people stalking, being spooky, being weird, you know, aggressive, and I'm a, I'm a tall person, and I'm going to naturally fight back, and... So it's not like I'm this little diminutive being, but I'm, you know, I'm a, if someone's going to pick on me, they really have a beef I mean, because I'm too tall to kidnap. That's you, what I've always said. Fans, if you haven't seen it, she beat the shit out of OJ Simpson and that's saying something in many aspects. <laughs> yes, I did. I head butted that bastard. <laughs> Um, yeah, he's actually in the book. So if you want to read a story about him, you know, what? and you know, and I like a fraternity vacation, it was, it was good. And you got to work of, I know everyone listening cause it's such a beloved movie on my page. You got to work with the original Karen, um, Marcy Darcy. <laughs> and Amanda Pierce. I mean, totally. what was that like? Cause that was before she was anybody right yes that was before married was with children before, was before fright night too i believe it was like maybe one of the very it was one of the very first things both of you guys did yeah absolutely for a lot of us and you know what's really well i'll answer your question amanda was amazing and i've got this one fabulous uh memory with her and Stephen jeffries um they had to do a horseback riding scene in the film and I'm an avid equestrian, and I've been riding all my life, and they were really nervous about it, and I said, well, why don't I take you guys, there's, you know, you guys are going to be riding the horses that are going to be at this barn, why don't we just go down there and, and talk to the guys and, and get you guys, you know, comfortable, we can go for a couple rides before you actually have to do any of that, and they were like, oh, really? So we had some really awesome horseback rides together, the three of us, and they just gave us horses and let us go. And we had a blast because it's like old riverbeds and stuff. So you're riding in the sand. It's really soft and everyone feels comfortable. Even if you come off, you're going to be fine. But nobody ever did. And we just, you know, and we did some hikes together. And Yeah, I mean, I was the youngest. I was 19 and everybody else was 21. So they, on Fridays and Saturdays, they all went out clubbing and I was totally left behind and um, I was cool with it. <laughs> I was like, oh, finally, everybody's left the hotel. <laughs> Jeffrey was cool. I, I mean, I got to meet him. He was he was a cool guy. Um, he could have had a, in my opinion, a real promising career as at least typecast as the nerd, like he was for quite a while. He just kind of fell off and did other things. I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, you know, people get um, drawn into whatever they get drawn into, and that's their journey. And we, as compassionate people, need to 
just support whatever that journey is you and uh, that's the way I hope that they're it. okay <laughs> yeah uh but wow what a great cast and you know what's really amazing about that is that i have circled back now like 35 years into my career I just worked with Courtney Gaines on the same film that Shuri J. Wilson was also cast in. I actually brought Courtney in. Now, Courtney, for the people that don't know, was in the very first film I did, Hard Bodies, with Grant Kramer and Teal Roberts and a lot of other really fun people, Classic Darcy DeMoss. Film. Yes. Oh, my God. And that movie was, like, made for, I don't know, ten grand. I mean, they, they literally had, like, student film on the side of all the camera trucks on – poster board so that we could rip off the entire Venice Beach and Malibu and everywhere else that we were shooting so that, it, you know, they never had to buy a permit anywhere because they just pretended that it was a student film. And then it gets picked up by Paramount Pictures. So it was like major, like in every, stu- in every theater. It's a cl- it's considered an 80s classic now. Both of them yes. are. Fraternity Vacation as well. They're both considered timeless classics. Uh, yeah. And so... So from Hard Bodies, I go work on this movie that's going to be streaming August 25th everywhere called The Silent Natural. In this movie, Branscom Richmond, who's one of the producers who played my brother, Bobby Six Killer on Renegade. He's he brought man, on, let me tell you. He's the greatest guy on the planet. And he brought on every single person that he's ever worked with, starting with me, Sam Jones, Sheree Wilson, Marshall Teague. Vernon Wells, Annie Lockhart. I mean, it goes on. And Richard Hurd. I mean, it, uh, God, I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, Barry Livingston, the, um, uh, this other guy from Greece. I don't really know him very well. We didn't get to work together. But, I, you know, the, the list was so amazing. And I was like, oh, my God. I have literally just circled back to, like, my entire career and Cherie is so much fun and she's such a sweetheart and she was of course in Fraternity Vacation and then I did a Hallmark movie last year with Matt McCoy playing my husband also from Fraternity Vacation you know if I would have known that uh, um, I did a guest spot on a show a few weeks ago rewriting Hallmark movies if they were made for adults with Charles Bronson coming in but um, yeah they were the Christmas ones though it was a tacky show but it was funny I forgot how many times you have worked with Sam Jones. He was an uh, awesome guy. I got to interview him. I got to meet him. Uh, he, he, two episodes of Renegade where he played different people each time. And then you were in a action movie with him, too, in the 90s, I believe, as well, correct? Yes. Yeah, it was uh, about a retribution on a marshal, like a, a Texas marshal. What's it called? Texas Payback. Texas Payback. God playing these titles up um yeah that was great we had so much fun and i got to ride a horse there as well they gave me this super cool trick horse and i sing in that film i play a vegas lounge act we got to shoot it all in las vegas and i get kidnapped by these guys that he had put in jail oh and um oh my god what's his name the guy Oh my God, I'm going to go crazy right now. I'm going to have to look that up. But they were just some amazing people. And, you know, I've, I've, I've been so lucky, Corey. I really have. I, I feel like, you know, I've had a long career and I'm still working. And I still am enthused by it. And I've got a, a massive passion now for the entertainment industry that really is more about gratitude than just the eagerness and desire to keep working. It's really like, I know what it takes now to get stuff made, and I'm writing and and directing and producing my own content, and it's been such a huge, um, you know, it's it's a big journey to do that kind of stuff, but it's such an accomplishment when you actually have a finished product. You're like, Oh my God! I did it. <laughs> well, I even mentioned that you were in uh, the uh, beloved show here, fans. You all like it, The Master with uh, Timothy Van Patten, who just yes. was so evil in class of nineteen eighty four. And 
Lee Van Cleef, and I have no idea who was under the ninja suit because clearly Lee Van Cleef grew a foot and gained 25 pounds <laughs> every time. That was a great show, and I really liked it, but everybody kind of remembers it as, I think the the pilot, the first two-hour movie, might have been Demi Moore's very first film, so a lot of people know oh. it as that, but... I mean, no uh, I mean, and that was a great show. It was ninjas, uh, but it was just in the wrong time frame. But yeah, when my when I was showing it to my wife, who was rolling her eyes during most of it, I was like, "That's Kathleen Kinmont," and she was kind of looking, and she was like, "Yeah, I think she always just calls you Cheyenne for some reason." But she was like, "Yeah, that I'm pretty sure that's her." I was like, "I'm gonna have to ask, otherwise I'm gonna look crazy." Well, you know what? It's interesting because. If you didn't really know me, it would be hard to identify me because I remember the director wanted me to do the entire thing while brushing my hair. <laughs> it was one scene, and he's like, how do you brush your hair? I'm like, normally. And I'm like, well, it's really long, so I usually have to bend over sideways to get it. And especially if I'm talking to somebody and you want to see the length of the hair, he's like, oh, yeah, 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 I like that. I said, so you want me to do the whole scene sideways, brushing my hair, never standing up? He said, yeah, yeah, I like that. I was like, oh, God, <laughs> really? I was so young. I think it was, I think that was my second job. My first was hard bodies straight out of high school. I think I got the master pretty much right after that. And I was a fan of Jimmy or Timmy. Um, I know, I know the whole Van Patten family. I've known them for a very long time. My mom used to play tennis on the David Marish circuit and they were all on the celebrity tennis circuit. So she played with, uh, Vince and Nels and Jimmy, I mean, the whole, you know, Dick, everyone. And now I'm, I'm still, you know, good friends with Nels and Jimmy. I just saw all of them, uh, at Thanksgiving, including, um, Joyce, the mom. And they were all together at this Italian restaurant that we all, uh, it's right right up the street from my Arthur Murray dance studio in Van Nuys. It's this little uh, Italian restaurant, La Oliva. It's a great little spot. And I, I was like, oh, my God, there's Timmy. Now, Timmy went on to direct. He designed oh, a Timmy. It's hell Tim of a, Van Patten. Hell of a director. Sopranos. Oh, my God. Like, that guy became... A Quentin Tarantino of television, okay, in, in my in my opinion. Oh, yes. Because The Sopranos was as gritty and as intense as it gets, and it was, you know, week after week after week. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to do my big summer romance as, as a film. I'm in a marriage with this TV series. You know, that takes some stamina. He was, I just showed my son maybe a month ago Tops class in 1984, and he really liked it. And he, and he even asked, he's like, so what's, what else has this guy done? And I was like, he became kind of a director after that. I was like, Did he, you haven't shown him White Shadow? I don't own that. I've seen a few of them. I remember his oh, nickname was Salami. Salami in that show. Yeah. That was his name. Yeah, <laughs> Salami. Oh, my God. That was him. And, you know, he probably learned everything from being on that series because that went for a while. He learned the stamina of what it takes. And so, yeah, when he saw me, because I was a day player, but we had a little, you know, we hung out for a minute and, you know, he's like, oh, my God. But do you know what's really interesting about that day? I mean, I worked on that show for one day. Mm -hmm. I get to the set out in Calabasas, somewhere out in this rural kind of farm country. And I, I always like to be super early because nobody likes to get yelled at. And I get there and I park and I see only one other guy and, and he's just kind of older looking dude. And I'm like, hi. And the show only really lasted six episodes, by the way. Yeah, it was not very long. It was super short lived. And I said, hi, I'm, um, I'm playing model number three or whatever I was and he he goes oh that's nice and I said I'm I'm trying to find the, the makeup wardrobe do you are you working on a show he goes he go, and he sticks out his hand he goes and, and so I naturally reach out to take his hand he squeezes my hand as tight as he freaking can and he goes I'm the master oh god 
It was Lee Van Cleef. Yeah. That Can was you the- imagine? What a douchebag. Like, I'm arriving, two seconds, young kid, don't know my ass from a tea kettle, looking for hair and makeup. I'm early. And there's fog. You know, it's not even light out. And he's being a dick. Can you even? Uh, That's my memory of the ugly. He, wasn't he the ugly from the good, the bad, and the ugly? Oh, I despise Westerns, but he was the bad. Well... He was the he bad, was bad and the ugly. Yeah, he, there was nothing good. <laughs> I know him uh, from The Master and, then, of course, Escape from New York. But, yeah, I just always thought that was funny. It was like when he would put on the ninja suit, it's like, man, he gained weight and grew in this amount of time. I mean, he was a good actor in his part, but it was very odd casting, to, which is what I've always said when I watch these action films. I would rather see a legit martial artist do this stuff, which, I mean, they had Shokasugi, but then just an actor trained to do a couple of quick uh, punches. I totally agree with you, and I bet the audience totally agreed with you, too. That's why it lasted for six episodes, and there's another reason why it lasted for six episodes, because he was not nice. And when you walk on to anywhere in anything, if you are going to be bigger than what the focus is, then you're going to take away from it. You're not adding to it. You know, and it's such a team sport, and if you don't have kind people at the head of the game it ain't going anywhere and that's been such a such an observance for me i I was born in this business you know i i know all kinds of famous people before i even stepped onto a set they were all around me that was the norm it wasn't a big deal and they're just people people (laughs) they're not that big of a deal nobody is I look at them as Wait. people doing a job. Their job just happens to be hey. one that's broadcast into millions of people's homes. Big deal. So is the newscaster. So is the weather guy. So is the YouTuber. Yeah, but none You of- know, there's a responsibility that people need to adhere to. I don't care if you're on TV or not. Is to be kind. Is to be considerate. Is to be compassionate. And if you don't do those things, you're not going anywhere. Your show's going to get canceled. Sorry, folks. That's the truth. I've seen it happen numerous times. And it doesn't need to be a show. It just needs to be life in general. Plus, as, as much as I like the show, I have no problem admitting that in 1980, whenever that would have been, six or so, four, five, three, six, I don't know. It was 84. 84. Uh, NBC primetime show about an old ninja master looking for his daughter I mean, had that been a syndicated show in the 90s, it probably would have had a seven-year run. But, yeah, that that was never going to be a primetime series. Let me tell you something. There's a show. There's so many shows. Like, take Courtship of Eddie's Father. Do you know why that show was so widely loved? Wasn't the theme song. The theme song Although that's super memorable. Oh, yeah. The theme song drew you in. But if it wasn't for Bill Bixby's absolute vulnerability in every single scene. Here's the thing. One of my greatest acting coaches, Sandy Marshall, said this to me once, and it stuck with me. She goes, you need to know how to lose. If you don't know how to lose, which means saying I'm sorry, means saying I'm wrong, means saying please forgive me, you know, if you don't have that, you're going to really be climbing a mountain for the rest of your life. It's never going to be downhill. It's always going to be uphill. And that guy was so off the bat, so, like, harsh and weird. I was like, oh, God, this is going to be a long day. I wanted to go home. I wanted to get in my car. I crushed my hand because I didn't know who he was. Who? How do I know who he is? I'm like... 18. He was a star from the 50s. There you go. He He made westerns in the 50s and 60s, yes. Yeah, and he had no gratitude. He had no, like, oh, well, welcome to the set. My name's Lee. Let me show you where the makeup trailer is. I've been here for a whole two weeks. I'm only going to be here two weeks longer because I'm a dick, (laughs) but I don't know that yet. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he got a little resurgence with the small parts in some John Carpenter films. That was well, yeah, and he gets killed. Yeah, pretty much. That's right because that's what we want to see happen, you know. 
But it, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be like, no, oh, he's, hey, I don't know him, he's not my friend. <laughs> crazy. This is a quarantine rant by Kathleen Kinmont. <laughs> well, when we mentioned Carpenter, you know, I've, I, I mean, my son, of course, know, you know, he, he's a Michael Myers guy. You know, we all know you from Halloween 4. I, I guess I have a, a two-part question about Halloween 4. One, do you get residuals for the countless amount of merchandise of Cops Do It by the book that's floating around out there? No. In fact, I uh, it took 30 years for me to get a residual because the original producer, um, whatever his name is, Went bankrupt. Uh, Mustafa Ahad, correct? Was there a right, yes. right. Such a hard name for me to pronounce or remember because I have such um, disappointment around that. How, because, you know, the, the, the film, even though he claimed bankruptcy, has played innumerable times everywhere in the world. And we've never received residuals from that. So that was part of the reason why I decided to go on the convention circuit to try and recover some of that. You know, I mean, obviously there's fans and I love to meet the fans. And I think fans are, you know, we are nothing without an audience. Otherwise, we're just standing there on the street corner doing monologues. Who cares? But when you have something that's a, of an incredible product like that, that they love and they want to know and, and they, that they respect the performances and they respect what you, what you did and, and they want to hear about it and that it's still fresh for them, you know, it was definitely, it, it's a disappointment. But, you know, I'm cool with it now and I think that his son who inherited the franchise or that particular one, they're starting to put the residuals on now. And I, I make my own T-shirts. So if anybody wants to hit me up for a cop suit by the book, sure. I've, I've finally made my own out of, you know, fans begging me to, to make them. And I, I got a great T-shirt maker who made a bunch of them. And, what, is yeah. it, what is it like? And this is really a personal question for me because, like, even when I told a couple of my friends that I was going to interview, the first thing, oh, my God, Kelly from, from Halloween Part 4. Oh, my God. It's like, okay, She's made so many action movies. She's been on countless TV shows. How does it feel to be remembered for Halloween 4 above all this other stuff that you've done? I'm proud of it. I think that it's um, it's really wonderful when people recognize a performance that, that really brings back a ton of memories for them or it's something fresh that they just saw and they're like, wow, that was really good. But it's as as an actor, you are as good as the people that are surrounding you. So I never really feel like, oh, it was just me. You know, I always feel like I'm so proud of everyone that's in that film. From Daniel Harris, who's just magnificent as a nine-year-old, who captured everyone's attention. And, and her vulnerability was palpable, and her... Her performance was so honest, and she was just, you know, like, what's more scary than seeing a little kid run for their lives? Jesus, wouldn't, you know, it's like everyone's worst nightmare is being that young and so raw. And Donald Pleasance, who was like a veteran great, who, you know, I, I got to, like, kind of pick his brain a little bit about acting, and I remember him looking over at me thinking, like, you're so young. This is, these are interesting questions you're asking me, you know, and I, I really wanted to know because I, I grew up in the business, but I knew who he was. And he was from Britain, so it even made him a better actor than the rest of us. <laughs> For some reason, it's like, you've got the accent. You must really know the key to success. And <clears throat> Sasha Jensen, who we went to school together. I mean, he took one of my best friends to prom. We all rode in the limo together and went to prom together and so I knew him. We actually worked at the same gym. We were, we were both, uh, I worked at the desk and he was kind of like a pseudo desk guy, trainer guy at this place called Tech Fitness, I think. It was right in, uh, Universal City. And, you know, and, and, um, Ellie Cornell, who was just lovely and awesome. And, and we all got along and we all hung out. And, you know, so honestly, I'm proud of everyone's performance and the fact that Dwight Little was so um, easygoing and supportive and had his act together. 
truly. Um, you know, I, you know what I do remember a lot from that shoot is that um, Michael. Oh, what's the guy's name that played Bobby Brady on Mike Looking Good? Is that right, uh, Bobby Brady? Uh, that sounds right. Is that is that right? God, I'm really. Oh, um, Sasha, don't have Sasha to Jensen. Huh? No, 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 no. No, I was saying the guy oh, that the played bunch? Bobby Brady on. Yeah, Mike. I think it's Mike looking good. Was our groundskeeper? It's an awesome last name, isn't it? It's so perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like it's like so good. <laughs> Better call Saul. You know that's his name. Saul Good. I, think, I like. Saul I think Halloween good. Four was so cool because, and I saw an opening night in the theater. And it, was, it was packed, and um, I think I really liked it because the way it was done different is you had the. Like the slasher film, of course, and the stalking and the psychological, but in the end, it kind of almost turned into an action film with Michael Myers and this truck and the car chase and everything. It was to me, it was always a really neat blend of the film. It was it's actually one of my favorites of the series, which is disjointed as that was. I mean, it's not saying a ton, but uh, I put four right after the original. I actually had part four better than part two. Oh, you know what? You and the rest of the the uh, the, the fans. Honestly, everybody that I get to sign for, not everybody, but a massive amount, more than some, way more, say that it's their favorite number. It's their favorite part of the franchise. And, and I think I know why. From the opening credits, Dwight Little did his research on what Halloween, The Harvest, was all about. He created imagery that drew you in, and then he created a reality that everyone could relate to. Small town. You know, a guy has a girlfriend, and there's another kind of sheriff's daughter girl that's kind of, you know, angling. So you have, like, these kind of B stories amidst this very dramatic reality of a guy who's been abused getting out of the insane asylum killing people and now he's on the loose and what that creates is a mob mentality a lynch mob it's like everybody gets it everybody gets what it's like being a scared little kid everybody gets what it's like having a girl try to steal your boyfriend and certainly we all know what it's like having some scary fucker out there in the world that's on the loose because we all have those in every single county that we're in ironically, at all times. My favorite horror movie of all time, ironically enough, is Halloween Part 3 that I don't count as part of the series because Michael Myers isn't in it. How stupid is that? Um, if they, they should thinking? have just called it Season of the Witch and it would have been a huge hit. You know, Now it took, what, 30 right. years to become a cult hit? I think it's the best horror movie ever made, in my opinion. Uh-huh. Well, that's cool, you know? And listen, they all, everybody, you know what I say to critics? Go try making a movie. That's just it. I mean, if I could make a movie, I probably would have by now. I'm, I'm happy just watching them. <laughs> but we also know that that's not the job for everyone. And maybe the job for some is just to critique them. And that's okay. So they have their gig and the creators have theirs and everybody has a responsibility. But we should, as much as possible especially when working in a franchise, um, is honor it. Honor what the whole, what the original idea was and how to, you know, branch out. Because it's a tree, right? It's a tree with a lot of branches. That's what a franchise becomes. And they all got to bear fruit. <laughs> when you were also in, you know, I mean, before Brian the Reanimator, you were in the franchise Snake Eater. Snake Eater to the drug buster you were in. I like the Snake Eater movies. I have the German DVDs. I'll be doing promotional work for the German Blu-rays with the limited cover art. I like those films. You know, that's another franchise that, that people need to get behind. Well, you know, Lorenzo and I have worked so much. And I don't think I've worked with any other person more than I've worked with him. And you know what's crazy is that I got the phone call today. And I'm not going to tell you what it is yet because it hasn't been solidified. But there may be something else we're going to be doing together soon. So you have good. to check back in with me. 
Well, yeah, and this is not, I mean, this isn't a thing that it's, like, focused on us at all. This is a, oh, I'm going to, and I'm going to quote it properly, because I just, I was talking to the producer this morning, and he's like, I said, you know, I think I'm going to be interviewed this afternoon, and he's like, oh, cool, I just want to talk about this show. And it's called Phoenix, which is really interesting, because the very first film I ever started in was Phoenix, The Warrior, and uh, this is this is different. Um, it stars um, myself, Maureen Price, Grace Byers from Empire, Garrett Wong from Star Trek, Michael Broderick from um, the HBO show with uh, Oh God, the um, it's it's the thing that keeps going from from one detective to the next. Two detectives. True Detective, yeah, he's in True Detective. Um, Rico Ross, Carmen Moreno, possibly Lorenzo Lamas if he signs on. Sean Ashley, Tiana D- D'Amico Coles. It, it, there's an amazing group of actors, and it's um, the storyline is Jane Doe, the lone survivor of an unmarked private plane that crashed in the wilderness, rises from the ashes with no memory of who she is, where she was going, or why. To uncover her identity, she must enter a world of corporate espionage, murder, and sex trafficking. With no one to trust and a target on her back, she may find that the truth inside her was better forgotten. And it's like badass, you know, female-driven, really cool. And it's, it's going to be a web series. So um, we've already shot the pilot, and now we've got the green light to finish. And uh, we're just waiting for... Um, the COVID numbers to die down and uh, start, you know, locking down locations. But, you know, they say it's like 34% back in LA. So uh, my brother, my younger brother, Johnny, who's a uh, pretty big executive um, guy over at Warner Brothers, who's, you know, on the line all the time to uh, get people back in the studios, they're, they're starting and they're, you know, it's, it's limited. But it's starting because the factory can't stop. Well, you know when you when you get back to that, if you need a henchman number two, I'm your guy. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm better than awesome. number three, but not good enough for number one. I'm a good number two. <laughs> Always a number two. <laughs> you know, you know uh, a movie that you did that I thought was ahead of its time. I actually was watching it when I was working out again the other day. To be honest with you. I uh, still think it's ahead of its time, and it it's probably my, this is going to sound weird, because I bet you've never heard this before. It's my favorite score of any film. I would love to get my hands on a vinyl copy of it, was uh, Night of the Warrior. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was a rock video come to life. It was, it was odd, but I have this I love the score of it. I actually really like the, I, I like the film quite a bit, and Ken Veray is just badass in it. Oh, he's so cool. Ken, oh my God. And Anthony Geary, too. Oh my gosh. And getting to work with Arlene Dahl, Lorenzo's mom, and uh, so many great people. I, yeah, I thought the score was really cool. It was really funky and jazzy and um, really uh, avant garde, for sure. Um, Rafa Zelensky was the director, and Thomas Ian Griffith. And his wife, Mary Page Keller, both big uh, soap opera actors from The Edge of Night. Uh, Thomas wrote it, and he's a major martial artist. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Excessive Force, of course, Karate Kid 3, oh, yeah. Cracker yeah. Jack. Yeah, I, I really like him. No, he's he's awesome. And, I mean, he's like six foot four, And uh, he wrote it for himself. Yeah, for Mary Page, and the, he they got it to Lorenzo's production company, and Lorenzo's like, yeah, sure, I'll produce it if I'm in it. And my wife said, plays the other part. So they were like, uh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was great that you guys did all those movies together. I mean, how awesome is that? I mean, you guys, you know, at the time you guys were married, you know you're doing all these movies together. I mean, that, I mean that's a dream come true in Hollywood. I agree. I agree. We, and Lorenzo even directed me in the CIA Codename Alexa Part 2 with John Savage. Uh, both great films. 
I, I like. <laughs> I, I love that you know all these. I love. I, I even when I interviewed um, Mr. Lamas, I even said like I love the simple, strange dialogue of Night of the Warrior. Like when you just look at him and you're like, he's showing you all these pictures, basically. Basically, if you really look at it out of context, he's like a pervert voyeur. And he's totally. looking at all these pictures and you're like, <laughs> these girls at the club, do you sleep with them? And he just looks, he's like nonchalant. Sometimes. Do you want to take my picture? And he's, it's like, what the fuck am I watching? But it's so good the way it's done. Come to life. <laughs> I mean, and the fight scenes were just brutal in the film. But no, I they love were. the movie. Like I said, the score is awesome. Yeah, James Liu. Oh, my God. I think he was the fight court. And Art Camacho. I mean, just like legends, these guys. Yeah. I uh, And, you know, I worked with Branscombe Richmond. Well, Lorenzo, I just talked to Branscombe yesterday. and He's like the coolest he, dude. And I, I've never met him, but just watching uh, all the stuff he's did, he's like, I totally want to interview him. He's like the coolest. He just seems like he's like the he's coolest next. guy in the world. You got, yeah, you got to interview him. He's the most wonderful, true. Well, and, and Lorenzo is too. I he mean, was you awesome. know, I, I he love, was so I love awesome. both these guys, and they are my family, and they are my friends, and we obviously have rich history. Lorenzo and I goes real deep, but and and Brands come too, and I, I just have so much respect for. You know, tenacity and dreams are they they need to they need to collide if you want to do something. If you really want to make something happen, you have you have to have the vision, but then you also have to have the delivery. So if you want and, and these guys know how to do it. They're they're very disciplined and you know, Lorenzo has recently shifted his gears into helicopter piloting, and that's what this this offer is for this show. Like I said, he's going to be uh, piloting helicopter, so you'll get to see an actor pilot a helicopter. I mean, I don't know anybody else who could really do that. John Travolta, Harrison Ford. I mean, who else has a pilot's license? Yeah, Harrison Ford. Angelina can't Jolie. Very good though. I I don't know that they, any of them know how to work a helicopter. I sure don't. I, I, I don't either. I mean, who is the other actor on the planet that knows how to fly a helicopter with I a would card? assume Steven Seagal, because he says he can do everything, and, and I believe him. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not the way he runs. Well, he does He does have an odd bit of running about him. As he wins the Run Like a Girl contest, no doubt, yeah, with, but, that, with that ponytail. He's definitely looking like... Uh, well, not Cardi B from behind, but he's definitely looking like some yeah, he's... shit. Now, the one film you did in the 90s, and I think it might have been before. Yeah, I, I'm positive it was before Renegade, was um, Final Impact. And that was oh, like the Michael only Ward. one. And the only thing about that, I was like, because I liked it. And, you know, ironically, in about two minute part, one of the, his first films had to have been the most highly downloaded interview I've ever done, Gary Daniels. And you had that small oh. part as the kickboxer. And right. I'm like, this movie's good. This movie's good. Okay, I like this. Mm, Lorenzo Lamas just died. Oh, wait. The kid that's outweighed by 85 pounds in this championship where there clearly is no weight division. I don't like this movie anymore. Like, like in the last 15 <laughs> minutes, it was like, I don't even want to finish this. This other guy would murder him. This kid's like puny. Yeah. It was really weird you know, casting. Nothing I... against the actor. It was just strange. I always question that as well as not just as an actor, um, but definitely as an audience member. I don't like watching the lead die ever, quite honestly. No. Um, leave that to Jesus. You know, that's, that was the, you know, that's it. We don't, we don't want to see the hero go. It's not, it's, it's, we want to see them fight for their life, and we want to see the bad guys go down. I'm just kind of saying, I don't, I don't really play into that either. It's a bummer. It, it doesn't no leave us feeling no redemption yeah. arc. He just gets right. hit in the face with the two right. by four in the alley, and he's dead. It's like, okay, yeah. this, this served no purpose. It's not like the kid had an emotional attachment. Now it was his dad. And he's going to get revenge. It was just weird. You know what I say to that? I say lazy writing. Yeah. I say to the writer, you need to go back. You need to go back and find out why he has to live. 
uh, Lorenzo. Not why, not why reality took him out, but why he beats the odds. Because that's where we are always as an audience. If you're going to take somebody's time for two hours, an hour and a half, whatever it is, to get settled, to get focused and watch something or read something or listen to something, it better have something of value. Yeah. And, and right? I mean, otherwise, we feel ripped off. We feel like, why did I invest? I could have been doing my laundry. I could have been vacuuming. I could have, you know, mowed the lawn. I don't know. I could have been doing something useful that actually, you know, made me feel good about stuff. Now I just feel like downhearted. And I agree. And that was very hard for me to do that day. I, I had to go and sit in a, in a room in the dark for like an hour and a half to work up those tears because I was just like not having it as, as a, as like somebody who was outside of myself, not agreeing with what the script was, but knowing what I was obligated to do. Yeah, you had 30 minutes of movie left over. after that. I say that again? You had like what? 30 minutes of movie left after he died. So yeah, you, it was just God. weird. And the audience, too. What a bummer. Yeah. I, <laughs> like, what are we going to do? Should we all go to the popcorn stand together? Yeah, it's like, well, the, the movie ended. I guess they'll just say it's a downer ending, but... Uh, it's a... Yeah, and spoiler alert for everybody who hasn't seen it. We sure didn't do that movie any favors. No, and, and I had asked, when I had interviewed Lorenzo, um, I asked him, I said, why did you die? And he, he's, like, he, he's like, oh, I didn't care. I didn't want to do another one anyway. It's like, all right, well, okay, this is a good answer. But, uh, then, and, and I, That's so Lorenzo. I, it has nothing to do with what the character was going to do. It just has everything to do with, like, I was over it. I'm yeah, tired of working for these people. Please kill me. I'm done. <laughs> he had it written into his contract that he would die in the last yeah, movie. I want to make sure I'm not in a sequel. Kill me. <laughs> I have to but ask. You know what's his... crazy is that Michael Worth, who is such a fine actor and such a, a wonderful human, is, is so good. And he's, you know, it would have been interesting to see, like, you know, maybe he, like, there, there, it would have been so cool if there was, like, a twist, like, if he was a bad guy and actually had something to do with it because he had a crush on me or something, you know, yeah. some kind of like weirdo twist where you're like, Oh, I didn't see that coming. But at least I'm kind of like on the edge of my seat again as an audience member still participating in the storyline. But it, you're right. It was like he died and every, and the curtains closed, but you still have 30 more minutes of film to watch. Yeah. I, <laughs> I it, it's kind of like in Marley and me when the dog dies and you just want to commit suicide. It's like, let's just stop the movie before that happens. You know? You, yeah. You, yeah. Well, she drops her necklace into the grave, and the children are all crying, ready to jump into the grave with the dog, too. And yeah. you're just like, now what? Now what? Do we go get another puppy? I already <laughs> cried when the goddamn dog died, and it took me about 10 minutes to stop. And then she pulls out the necklace and says, buy clearance, dog. I start crying again <laughs> uncontrollably. I, I fucking know. hate that movie. I, I kept telling myself, the dog's better off without these horrible people, but it still didn't make me stop bawling. Hysteric. It's the only movie I've hysterically cried at. <laughs> You know what they should have done at the end of that movie is just start playing memories. It moves, you know, just start playing the dog, dog memories. Old. Yeah, the only the only redeeming quality was like you should write a book about it, make a million dollars. He's like, okay, I guess so. Yeah. And you're like, wow, did I just get duped or what? Yeah, <laughs> I need was... to go hug my dog. Yes, I have three of them, so it's very depressing. So, oh well, you know what? When we sign up for life, we sign up for death. It's true, and that's just the reality. Everybody gets old. We're all going to go. We're just trying to outlive each other, or not, because we don't want to have to keep going to everybody's funeral. It's like, what's the win? The win is telling everybody in the moment. When you have the opportunity, and don't miss those opportunities to tell them that you love them, that they did a great job, that you gave them a compliment somewhere, somehow in their life. And that's life. That's what we get to do. We get to love people, and we get to build them up. That's it. Ironically, that's it. ironically as nice as that is, it's a strange lead into the second film I want to ask you about, which is CIA Codename Alexa, star. <laughs> Starring him, I, I, I'm a fan. I, I I have no shame admitting it. O.J. Simpson. Um, I I only know him from movies and football. I liked him. 
Um, yeah, me too. Me too. I really like that. How how come you think that one didn't get as much press for you? I mean, you, you clearly that was you doing your stunt work and everything in it. Um, your fighting scenes were great. The movie was very good. Uh, PM Entertainment did not make bad movies as far as action goes. It was it was a great film. It was a great showcase for you, in my opinion. Well, because I think it would be like to the equivalent now of having me be in a movie with Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. Or Harvey Weinstein. You know, people are just like, they've lost their taste for it. No thanks. You know, the only thing they wanted to see about him was him going to jail. They didn't give a shit at all about O.J., the actor. O.J., the football player. The sports hero. This is a guy who brutally murdered his wife in cold blood. And her boyfriend. Or her friend. Or whatever he was. But he murdered two people, and he got away with it. And it's appalling. And nobody cares what he did before. Nobody. And good. They shouldn't. That's no. I'm a. I don't. I'm I haven't a, watched that movie since. I'm a. I don't want to see that. Yeah. I'm a wrestling fan. And when uh -huh. the, I don't know if you watch wrestling, when Chris Benoit murdered his family, I, I mean, uh, you still hear all these people nowadays. He should really be in the Hall of Fame for his accomplishments. It's like he murdered his yeah. wife and kid. He shouldn't be in anything. I'm glad he's dead. Absolutely not. We should not glorify Charles Manson. You know, I, I love what Quentin Tarantino did with Once Upon oh, a Time in Hollywood. Best movie and of the it, year. It really was. It really, really was. And I love what he does with his films where he takes a non-fictional moment and fictionalizes it into a way where we can stomach it. Because I, the appalling shit that people do is horrific and, and traumatizing to people that weren't even there when it happened. Like, I wasn't there. I wasn't even born. Yeah. I wasn't there during Inglorious Bastards. I didn't That's like just that something I've read about in in the history books. Yeah. But yeah, would I want to carve a swastika in some kind of Nazi officer's forehead to identify that this is a murderous asshole? Yeah. I think that's really fitting. I'm, I'm watching Yellowstone right now, which is such a fabulous series. I'm crazy about it. I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm eating it like, uh, like coffee. Like you have to go really slow, otherwise <laughs> your feelings will pop out. <laughs> My wife, before I mention what what she keeps watching, I have one more I got to mention here real quick. Uh -huh. um, about 15 years ago, when podcasts first came out, before it was famous people, and it was just basically nerds in their basement. I uh -huh. used to be a frequent guest on them because people find me entertaining for some reason. And the movie that well, I... Well, you're knowledgeable. I, the sure. movie I champion, one of, I, it's in my top ten list. Final Round. One of the oh, greatest wow. movies ever made. It, to me, it's the akin of low budget, no offense, um, yeah, no, it is. Running Man. And, <laughs> and I liked it. Wow. And, and I remember one guy was like, well, is, that's the girl from, once again, we got to go back to, that's the girl from Halloween. It's like, well, you get to see her in this movie too. It's like, come on, this is the great. And, and I tell you, I must have convinced over a, easy out of all this stuff I did, probably a hundred people to watch it. And they all loved it. I mean, it's, wow. it, it needs a, it needs some kind of release here. I mean, I got a bootleg copy because it only came out on a VHS wow. back in the day. Right. I don't even have a copy of that. I didn't I even think, I, I think I've only seen that film once. I love it. I watched it a couple that weeks was, ago. That was a marathon. Really? That was a marathon to work on. God, we were exhausted. Those were all night shoots. I own every that, movie that, that I've That movie reminds me of NyQuil and Closing the Shades. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that was another one. It was so simple, but it I was would take, so good. I shot at NyQuil 2 Excedrin p.m. and I'd go to sleep at 9 a.m. and wake up at 4 p.m. to be on the set at 6 p.m. to get home at 6 a.m. to close my eyes finally at 9 a.m. Um, and 
Yeah, Lorenzo was wearing overalls, I think. Yeah, my wife made fun of that to no end a few weeks ago. I showed my son. <laughs> she just couldn't get over that outfit. And I had to it remind was like, her, I was like, no, honey, honey, let's what go back in the day. I wore them too, and much like I did, we, we don't have them fully strapped up. They're hanging down on one side, you know. Oh, yeah, That was yeah, the style. Sexy. Yeah. Well, you know why he think, I think he did that is so he could just be so padded up underneath because he was just being like, why don't we just drag him across the parking lot? Because we haven't done that yet. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? In fact, Let's drag him across Dodger Stadium parking lot because Costco isn't big enough. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that guy had his ass kicked from here to eternity on that movie. And, you know, this is why, you know, Lorenzo and I have gone through a tremendous amount. But I have such respect for who he is as... An artist, as an athlete, as a as a coworker, as somebody who's <clears throat> I'm literally getting choked up right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Somebody who's so kind to the crew. You know, these people show up and they're working their ass off for you. And they're doing their best so that you don't have to do it again. Because somebody on the crew didn't, A, light you properly, mic you properly, focus you properly, direct you properly. You know, they, in, in low-budget independent, you are primarily rehearsing on film. You don't have the luxury of, hey, guys, let's do two months of rehearsal and like get these fight scenes right. You might be figuring it out on the day of. Or you might have had the luxury of having one fight day rehearsal or two, you know, before actual production. And, like, that's just, like, a basic mapping it out. You know, it may change on the day. Let's, it may change during the actual filming because who knows who just walked into a freaking face punch, mm -hmm. you know, who didn't lean out when they were supposed to, who leaned in when they were supposed to lean out. How many times has that happened? You know, the the... The ability to capture it on film is inches of what sells and what doesn't. Inches of people getting wounded, having their nose broken, teeth knocked out, head fractures. I don't know. Heads being blown off by a helicopter blade. Shit happens on sets that is so unnormal from every other job on the planet. It is safety first, and when you are working in low budget and time is of the essence, and here comes the sun, and we're losing the light, either one. Pick a, pick a light bulb, you know, and pick, pick who's exhausted or who's coming down with the flu or whatever. There's just so many components that make this stuff actually happen and, and what's written on the page and who's, you know, who's bringing their A game today, who's bringing their B game today. Who doesn't give a shit? So when I when I look at you know the span of, of all the different experiences that I've had and the people and and the different equations that happen, Lorenzo, <laughs> he's like so ahead of of what he's been acknowledged with. I think. You know, he, he deserves way more. And I think probably because his personal life started to overshadow what his professional life was, you know, the, the, the marriages, the kids, and all that stuff. But, I mean, talk about consummate pro, truly, and, and a great athlete and a great martial artist. He has black belts in three different forms of martial arts. You know how hard that is? I mean, he, you do. <laughs> he, is the, he is the only person, and I told him he's the only person that I ever interviewed that I was nervous about, like, the whole day prior to. Because wow. I was such a big fan. And uh -huh. generally, you know, it's like, ah, if you're a big fan of somebody, they, you know, is this going to and you know, uh, about an hour and a half, I think, uh, that we talked and everything, and, uh, he answered every fucking stupid question I asked him. And believe me, I asked him a lot of stupid <laughs> questions. 
and uh, you know, he's never annoyed or anything. And I mean, I remember his workout video for Christ's sakes. So okay. yeah, I mean, yeah, the big joke always was that I had a crush on him. It was like, no, no, I used to tell girls like in a bar that I was a bounty hunter. I copied the look. I was like, I didn't have a crush on him. I, in matter of fact, I I owe him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and me both, Corey. <laughs> and then you know, and, and then I, I we I mean, both had a crush on him. <laughs> well, I didn't have one. My wife did, as what I was going to say. The when you said you watch Yellowstone, ever since I interviewed him a while back, my wife every night is watching because I own that. I actually have every movie I've mentioned to you. I do own. Uh, I also own the complete collection of Renegade, where that's what I think a lot of people know you a lot as too. You were Bobby Six Killers Half Sister Cheyenne, and that that show should have went on three, four more years easy. Should have had a better ending. Well, I blame myself. Um, you know, I went and did the Howard Stern show, and it really it, it did not have a good ending. No, you, and you, I, you didn't have anything to do with that. USA killed that show with the uh, show. Well, because it five they fired me. I think they fired me, and I think a lot of people watched the show because of my character, and they got really into it. And then they fired me. They didn't. They didn't fix my storyline. Um, they just replaced me. They didn't talk about me. And I think people went like, screw you. They, That's not cool. Now, you know? they did once. I remember Bobby got off the phone with you. Oh, he did? <laughs> yes. He was like, I was just talking to Cheyenne. I, I do remember that. But uh, <laughs> the one line I but have She said to, she's not coming back. <laughs> I mean, I think what made that she show. She means it. <laughs> What made that show so good to me was that you and it, it's rare you can you can tell very easily if you pay attention the three of you I won't count Stephen J Cannell because he was wasn't in all of them I'll count the main you Lorenzo and Branscombe Richmond you guys really were like a family you could see the gen not just the chemistry you could see the general love that you guys all had for each other and it came through it came through when you were watching it you know I mean you were vested oh. in everything. Yes, we we truly listened to each other. We truly played off of each other. We had uh, great chemistry, each each one of us, independently. Branscom and I had great chemistry, and Lorenzo and I still had great chemistry because I still respected him so much, and he was still happy to have me on the show. And uh, Branscom and, and Lorenzo were awesome together. They were so, so connected. And... Um, yeah, th those are the things that actually work, and I, and that's what I'm saying. Like you know, you nobody felt like they were better than anybody else, and we knew that we were really lucky to be doing what we were doing. We all had a gratitude for the job, to be part of the Stephen J. Cannell franchise, to be part of Stu Siegel Productions. The people that every single person that worked in San Diego on that show was awesome and they've all gone on to work on fabulous shows every single one of those people if they haven't passed on is still in the business i mean the, and, uh, and the elvis doing episode, amazing work the elvis episode had leia remedy oh. in it when she was like probably oh, yeah. 19 uh emma caulfield was in the uh, teen angel episode she went on, I, I had a crush on her when she was on buffy the vampire slayer sam jones was in like two or three episodes uh i mean yeah i mean it was just littered with Wayne Newton was in an episode, for God's sake. Oh, oh my God. Um, you know, uh, Olympic athletes, Oscar De La Hoya. Um, and I just watched the episode with, um, oh God, the other boxer. Um, super cute. Oh, my God. He even, he even autographed uh, boxing <laughs> gloves for my parents. Um Oh, God, he was in the 1984 games. I can't remember his name, but he's super cute. Oh, I'm going to have to look it up. I have a picture of it. You yeah, know Tiny what? Lister in one episode, for God's sakes, playing a Oh, boxer. Tiny Lister, I know. That's Zeus, for God's sakes, you know, I mean. Uh, Endless. Endless. Only... Jeffrey, uh, yeah, beyond. I mean, we were so, we were always so excited to see a, who the guest cast was, and B, who the guest director was. Yeah. That, by the way, that Elvis episode was directed by um, uh, Moondoggy. Um, oh, God. From the 50s. 
I want to say Peter Fonda, and I know that's wrong. No, it's um, not him. From the moon, from the moon doggy, um, you know, the beach with, yeah. with, with Sally Fields. I mean, yeah. So it, it goes on and on, and I'm I'm eternally grateful for that experience and being able to be a part of that. So yeah, the yeah. only time I ever cringed was it was in one of the. It might have been the second episode, second or third, and I remember. Oh, I like the for some reason Reno Reigns always went to small towns and was the sheriffs never knew who he was but there was one where they he got caught like like in a lot of them girl calls you and she's like I'm not sure his name he had long hair he was really gorgeous and you're just like oh that's him it's like oh come on <laughs> Who's writing this part here? Well, you know what is interesting is that we didn't film the pilot first. We filmed the pilot third because they knew, because Stephen Cannell, the genius that he was, knew that people aren't getting their stride until, like, episode number three. So that's when we'll shoot the first show. See, I but thought everybody's the show got... really relaxed. So number three was shot first. So that's probably why it felt a little like, eh, oh, 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 eh, oh, oh, oh. you know, the factory is just starting to get the juice and the grease and who's doing what and who are these characters and what am I doing and who are, you know, it was just like, you know, it was brilliant. I'll always remember that. If I, if any of my pilots that I've written and that, you know, I've written and produced a couple, if they ever get put into production and we go back, you know, shoot number three first. So that everyone that has already connected to you from watching episode one will kind of forgive that number three because <laughs> they already got hooked by the good one, which is number one, which is filmed third, you know, and everyone was like, well, oiled. <laughs> uh, and, and no offense to you or, or Lorenzo, Branscombe Richmond made that show. I mean, because he, oh, yes. he, he, if you watch like, you yes. know, Lorenzo's playing it, he's playing it, he's the lead, he's so serious. So cool. You're right. serious. It's going to be cool. Uh -huh. Branscombe was playing it. I don't want to say. The energy. It. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, almost, it was, he was, I don't want to call him the comic relief because he was a badass on the show, but he did bring a lot of comedy, you know. I'm, he was absolutely the comic relief, no doubt. He brought so much energy, and that is him. You know, he, he got, he had to audition. I never auditioned. Lorenzo never auditioned. Branscombe auditioned. And he got in that energy, and I, and he has told me, and, and hopefully when you get him on the show, you can tell him what was the auditioning process like for a Renegade, because it's a great story. And he, um, you know, like everyone knew Stephen Cannell shows, Rockford Files, Simon Simon, all these great shows. Brilliant stuff, Sunny Spoon. And they're very, they're dramatic, and all the guys are like, cool. You know, and, and it was like, if, if you've already got, if you've got one person doing that, that's enough. And Lorenzo was that. I mean, I was a different kind of cool because I was a female. But, you know, you didn't need me to be all goofy. If you have, if you have one big goof, that's enough too. And Branscombe did definitely bring the badass because he could turn on a dime. But that was like part of his, like, you know, he played the good cop. He played the, hey, hey, this guy over here with the long hair. Well, everyone had long hair, but he's like, you know, he's going to he's gonna brood you to death. I'm, I'm going to friend you to death. He had the most awesome yeah. mullet, too. I mean, only <laughs> only two people have good mullets in life, and that's him and Brian Boswell. Billy Ray Cyrus. No, oh. Boz. <laughs> but no, Branscombe's mullet, mullet was just... It was it was a yeah. thing of thing of beauty, and I mean the one we just watched, the Teen Angel, with the uh, where there the guy is uh, pimping out the underage girls, and his subplot is he's going to make an infomercial about being bounty hunters. I mean, it was just so <laughs> funny. I mean, it was, but then in the same sense, you're watching him throw a keto clotheslines onto a bunch of guys. So it's yeah, it was it was his character was just so well done. Yeah, he had that patented move, and I had the patented jumping front kick, which was always impressive when they put the camera, like, directly in front of me. So it just looked like I was, you know, clipping the camera right in the, under the chin. But, yeah, Branscombe, 
he and he was and he was a stuntman. I mean, that was his uh, that was his introduction really into the business. And he can't he come like all three of us, by the way. All of our parents were already in the business. So we were, the three of us, all second generation performers. And I think because of that, we all understood very deeply how lucky we were to have these jobs and, and the responsibility that came with that and the, um, the, the true like dedication that it takes to work for seven to eight months out of the year on something and, and keep that same energy level. And we all, um, we all really stoked each other's fires. And even you know, when Lorenzo and I broke up halfway through the second season. You could never and, tell. Right. Continued to work together, split up for two and a half more years. And that was as emotionally rough as I've ever experienced any kind of professional life. But it certainly gave me and, and everybody else um, that was experiencing that situation with us a lot of fortitude to to make this show uh, as good as it can be because it was saving it was saving me emotionally and and you know I didn't want to be like well I'm out of here guys because this sucks now mm-hmm. you know sorry about your paycheck. Sorry about the dream that you had about making this show go as long as possible because we're working on a Stephen Cannell show down in San Diego having the time of our life. You know, it was like really, really making some some bigger bigger choices instead of just looking at poor little me and my little marriage to the lead of the show and sour grapes and I, I loved the character. I loved the people. I loved the show. I loved still working with Lorenzo and Branscom. And and I'm so glad that you could never tell. And, of course, that's when the writers really started getting creative, like, let's make Cheyenne really fall in love with Lorenzo. Or, you know, Reno and Reno needs to ask Cheyenne to marry him now. No, nah, no. Nah, that, <laughs> that, would, that would ruin it, though. I mean, that was the whole... No, they did. They did. Like, I, like season three. In fact, I would just watch that episode. I think it's called... That's the one with the with the boxer, something junior. Mm. It just worked better when he rolled into every town and had sex with whatever random hayseed you know was there. So yeah, you know, I know. Was, I mean, because it was just it was a western. It was a modern day western. He didn't have a horse. He had a bike. I mean, the, the formula well, worked. Right. He does sort of fall for me because we have this episode where we are. Um, going undercover as a husband and wife on our honeymoon. And we're trying to get this bad guy to get interested in me. And because we're really playing it up as a husband and wife and we're like kind of fake kissing and, and then you have those moments where the characters are like, Oh, wow, that's right. You really are kind of somebody that I like. And, you know, and they, they started, um, creating that a little bit, not too much, but there was that, that episode. And then at the end of that episode, he was going to ask me to marry him. Oh, Reno was going to ask Cheyenne to marry him. And I say, it's never going to happen. All I see is, is you running from the law for the rest of your life. And I'm, how can we have a life like that? And see, I tried protecting. They planned it in season two when you were in love with the guy that you used to know who killed his wife, but you thought he was innocent. And then at the very end, Lorenzo comes, because in season two, he dove off things a lot and he dove yeah. off the cliff and saved you. And right. You once, say, I think that's that once burned twice there. shy. Yeah. That was, that was a great episode too. Yeah. I mean, they did that. And that was after we had split up as well. So there were, there were a lot of moments where we were not together as a couple, but together as a, uh, working, actors <laughs> playing different part playing parts no. and having to get into um, close situations together and have that be a reality for those characters and talk about a real um, I mean I'm like acting wow it's such a big challenge it's really just a commitment it's a commitment to the truth and 
if you're if you trust the other person enough to really go there, you're going to be absolutely fine. And both people need to really trust each other. And that was the beautiful thing about us. Even though we weren't working together as a husband and wife, we still really trusted each other as actors. I never, I never fucked with him on the set. He never fucked with me either. I mean, there was once a couple, you know, maybe once, but. You know, I forgave that. That's in the book. People really want to know what went down by my book. Now I've got. I don't care, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna publicly state this. You can tell me uh, <laughs> in six months if I'm correct. You can do a thousand more interviews between now and next year. No one will have a better intro than this. You, because I'm such a fan. You got to work when he was very, very young on an episode with Sam Jones, the uh, race car episode with Walton Goggins. Who went on oh, to yeah. become, you know, great actor was in uh, the Hateful Eight with Quentin Tarantino, a guy yes. who you wished you would have been nicer to, which is all the title of your new book. <laughs> Can you tell me? I, I gotta know. I know you want people to buy it. What did you do that was so mean to Quentin Tarantino? <laughs> he was in my very first acting class. I was sixteen, and he was nineteen, and uh, or maybe eighteen. Um, but we were the teenagers in the class. It was a small uh, professional actors, uh, adult actors in this uh, James Best Theater. James Best was the um, the actor that was in Dukes of Hazard. Them Duke boys are getting the whole homosexual. Remember that guy? I, you know, yeah. and I, I, I guarantee if that show ever came back, they'd edit the car, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Well, James Best opened up a theater in Toluca Lake, and it was very intimidating for me because I, I had already been um, in commercials as a child, but I, I hung it up for a while to play sports, and and then around fifteen, I said to my mom, you know, I really think I want to, I want to be an actor, and she said, well, then I would advise you to go to class, go and get on stage and start working on scenes and working with the theater group and working with professional actors because if you're going to be an actor here in this town you're going to have to learn how to be in front of a camera and to be in front of a camera you're going to have to know what it feels like to be on stage with people watching you not teachers not students not people going oh you're so awesome you got up on stage it's like no this is how you do this and you have to break through all that kind of fear and and you know being intimidated by by people that are better than you and know more than you, and you have to be able to step up up there and hold your own. So I said, okay. She said, there's a great theater up the street. Here's the money. You know, go sign up. So I rode my bike. I got there, and there's this guy at the back of the class, and he's scribbling on a notebook, a spiral notebook, and, you know, he's kind of keeping to himself, and you know, I went to one or two classes, and I'm, you know, getting sides for, you know, screwed up teenage girl with a mom that's really irritated because you're such a bitch, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, learning how to play a teenager mm -hmm. is really hard when you're working with recognizable TV actors <laughs> in this very adult class. And it was intimidating. And then he came up to me one day, and he's like, hey, I kind of want to do a scene with you. And I've written a scene, but it involves kissing. And I was like... Oh God, no! Um, you know, I wasn't ready for that. It was so straight out of the gate, and I went to the coach and I said, "You know, please, under no uncertain terms, put me with this guy with the frenetic energy and who's writing scenes, and I'm just not ready for that." You know, I'm not. So, I could see him being really pervy when he asked too, for some odd reason. Well, he's Quentin. He's got a very unique personality, and God love him. I have the greatest, most utmost respect for him, and this is nothing about me putting him down or or anything. It was just me being really green and not having the skill set that would have said, hey, you know what, I'd really love to do a scene with you, but let me get used to being on stage with the adults first, and then us teenagers can give it, a, give it the good old college try and get up there and act out a kissing scene that you wrote out for me you know like i don't know i didn't i didn't have the wherewithal that i have now so what what this whole book really is about is about and here's the thing first of all 10 years ago when tanya mckiernan who's stephen cannell's daughter 
took me to the DGA Awards. First of all, she started out on Renegade as a second second AD, which is pretty low on the totem pole, but it's still in the AD position. So she, her, all her hours on these shows went towards becoming a member of the DGA. Okay. And while she's at it, she's learning how to be a director. Certainly not something I would have ever thought to do or anybody ever told me, you know, like she didn't want to be an actor. She, you know, her dad was a writer, creator, producer. So naturally he's, he was like, you know, do you want to have longevity in this business? <laughs> Become a crew member. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, so she and I, we started, you know, early on and, and, and she's a little bit younger than me. And now she's like a major TV director, ER, and you name it from there, from there on. She's directed everything. She's amazing. And she took me to the DGA Awards literally January 30th, 2010. Uh, Quentin was there for being nominated for Inglorious Bastards. Um, Cameron uh, Crow was there for um, Avatar. I actually have the freaking program right here in front of me. It's sitting on the side of my bed. Um, and uh, Catherine Bigelow from The Hurt Locker. I mean, Norm, you know, Norman Jewison was getting the Lifetime Achievement Award. Roger Goodman, Robert Iger, Audrey Life, Barry Meyer. I mean, it was such a big night. The Frank Capra Award went to Cleve Landsberg. It was so huge. Um, yeah, James Cameron, uh, Avatar, Lee Daniels for Precious, Jason Reitman for Up in the Air, Quentin for Inglorious. Catherine Bigelow won. Um, first time ever, female won the DGO. So I said to, while they're playing his, you know, they're all like five minute trailers because it's the DJs, you just play it out. So while they're playing a long DG, you know, Inglorious trailer, I lean over to Tanya and like, you know, one day I'm going to write a book called I Should Have Been Nicer to Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> and she's like, oh, that's so funny. You must. And I go, what, write the book? She goes, no, you must go tell him before we leave. And I took that as like a total double, triple, quadruple dare. And I was like, well, I'll tell you what, I will go say that just to like go say hi because he's going to remember me. And he's worked with so many people that I work with. Um, so I know that he's, he knows about me. He's just followed my career, I'm sure. And, and um, I'm like, if he wins, I'm not going to do it. But if he doesn't, I will. So he didn't. And there he was down at the front. Doug Beverly Hilton, where I actually have my prom, um, where they shoot the Golden Globes, and he's down there with Brad and Angelina and Christoph Waltz and everybody, and I'm like, I make my way down, and I looked nice, I felt confident. <laughs> he saw me coming towards him, and he's like, oh my god, Kathleen, and I'm like, hey, yeah, he remembers me. And I get up and I go, hey, Quentin, I'm just, first of all, Congratulations on your career. You are amazing. Everything you do is gold. And I just want you to know, I, one day I'm going to write a book called I Should Have Been Nicer to Quentin Tarantino. And he put his head back and he would laugh. And he thought that was so great and complimentary. And he's probably thinking like, yeah, you should have. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that. But I thought, you know what? That's funny. I made him laugh. I made her laugh. What is, what is that really about? What is what are the regrets in life? Are they just there to be regrets, or are they there to be stepping stones in your learning curve? To wow, if something like this kind of happens again, how will I respond? Knowing what I know now, how will I respond to the genius in the room that might be really different and really unique and not something that any of us have ever seen before? How will I respond to that person who's not the norm, who doesn't look like Lorenzo, who doesn't have the social skill set that other people might, that seem more uh, comfortable? And, you know, I just really started to look at that, like, because now more than ever, we're embracing unique qualities. Like, oh, my God, you're so different. This is so bitchin'. You know, like. Who wants vanilla anymore? Yeah. Let's bring on the freaking Rocky Road with bacon drizzle. Maybe. He should put <laughs> you, you know? in his 10th film. 
Hey, I when you read my book, which I hope you really do. I will. Um, I've already, I, you know, I've already explained, like, my biggest fear on the planet is bears. And I just came back from Mammoth where I saw two of them. I mean, like, I go there all the time and I see bears and I'm like, why do I keep going to a place that I'm so inherently, like, I, I come unglued. Like, I, I have, like, must be some kind of, I must have been, like, killed, like, Brad Pitt in Legends of the Fall, like mm -hmm. in a past life, <laughs> where I just go into the forest and get clawed to death. But I think that here's here's my um, my my uh, idea, my character idea for Quentin is that it was some kind of like carnival uh, set uh, circus that travels from town to town back in the Depression. Remember that show, that Nick Stoll show, Carnival, carnival on yes. HBO? Brilliant. Right? Brilliant show. I love that show. I was so excited to work with him on T3. I couldn't believe it. And, um, you know, something like that where it's really rural, you know, and you've got these, like, wild caged animals that nobody really knows how to train or ever will completely. Somebody's always going to get hurt. And, uh, you know, I'm like a, a really aging high wire act that just doesn't know when to quit. And I fall off the high wire into the bear cage. <laughs> and the only way they can really save me from being mauled to death by a bear is with a flamethrower, because that's what he really loves. He loves those flamethrowers. And then he could, like, have his ultimate Calvin Kinmont revenge moment. <laughs> this is this is sounding more like a Rob Zombie movie here. <laughs> Well, not if you shoot it properly. Well, that's and nothing again. I like Rob Zombie movies, so no, that's not an insult. Okay, either. good. That's, not an that's insult either one. Yeah, I mean, no, that's uh, that could also be I, your uh, Rob Zombie loves to get people that have been into horror movies in his horror movies. So, I mean, there you go. Well, you know, Corey, that would happen if I didn't look exactly like Rob Zombie's wife. I am always going to never, ever be in a Rob Zombie movie mm -hmm. because he always puts his girl in those movies, and you I'm just like a dead like ringer. It. No, 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 no. I met his wife. You look, uh, I don't, this sounds really tacky because she was nice to me when I met her. Um, you're a lot prettier than his wife. You know, I you know if <laughs> she ain't going to remember me. I met her at a concert. I mean, it's not like we hung out, so I just oh. happened to, uh, Managed well, to weasel my way regardless in the of the, the, you know, the beautyometer or whatever it is, but I think that just out of his loyalty to his lovely bride, that it would be too much of a, of a sphere. I don't know. Maybe, or maybe we could have like some kind of crazy twin thing, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm like the evil twin or the good twin. I don't care. People, but people I, shit on I did her, try she's a it, good actress. She is. No, she's committed. She does her job. I have no part problem. I, I just I know what the intricacies are of uh, that kind of personal situation. And because here's the thing, when I went to the Halloween premiere, his first Halloween premiere, mm -hmm. um, I tried very hard to go and introduce myself, and she was kind of cock blocking me pretty well. <laughs> I, I mean, I, it was basically our meeting was, hey, I'm a great concert. I'm a big fan of your films. And, you know, thank you very much. It was like you were so good in, in Halloween. You know, you should have gotten some type of warning. Thank you. And then I had to make my move where I was going to get thrown out in, in an alley and beat by a, a couple of security guards. So it was a real quick encounter. You know, that movie was so terrifying because William Forsythe was so believable. When you have a stepfather beating the living shit out of some kid, the, the the reality factor for that, for me, was just like, well, of course he's going to turn into a mass murderer, you know? And it was just that chilling, you know, beating with the bat of those kids and the sticks out there with those leaveless trees and the piles of leaves and just you know it just it felt it felt right it felt like it almost felt like a documentary the sad thing yeah. is is you felt so much pity for this kid you, yeah. sh you shouldn't have felt any sorry for him i mean he grew up to be a homicidal maniac but you're like 
I can but see no, why this poor guy the backstory. snapped. I hope this he gets some of these punk teenagers when he gets older. You know, I mean, well, yeah, this was... is why Joker did so well, right? Oh, Joker hell of a, I'm a comic had collector. The and that was a hell of a movie. It, well, when you have the backstory to support why a character does what they do, now you have a sympathetic bone, and you're like, and that's the greatest place for an audience because it's confusing. Now you're being thoroughly manipulated by circumstances, which is exactly how we all are in our life. And that's what makes it relatable. How many people right now are being manipulated by a narcissist with personality disorder? Yeah, that's... And the weird thing with Joker, whenever, and there were cops at the theater when we went opening night and all, but it was just like, this movie's gonna, it's gonna teach you about violence. It's like, if you pay attention, what the movie should teach you is be nice to fucking people with mental disabilities. Right, that's, because that's you have no idea how away. they got them. Well, you you have no me. idea. He was another they could one. have been bashed to get in their brains as an infant. And I felt so, you felt so bad. He played the part so well, and I'm a comic collector, like I said, but you felt so bad for him. It's like, gee, I hope in part two he kills Batman, because I really like this guy. You know, I mean, it, and he played that the wonderful part. It deserved that Oscar. I never thought I'd live to see the day when a comic book movie got an Oscar. Well, I mean, thank God, because those are sympathetic characters. You know, every every writer who is creating something that finds its niche is doing something because it meant something to them, because it moved them. And if it moves the person who's writing it or drawing it or whatever, now you you are guaranteed that it's going to at least move one other person. Because if, it, if it's a truth, then it's a truth. You know, if, if Johnny Cochran, if those guys on the Dream Team said, you know what, here's a man who has had multiple head injuries on the football field, who has had his brains bashed in on a regular since middle school, who the only way he could get away from having his brains bashed in was by running as fast as he could. This guy, let's take a look at his brain scan. If they did that, and he admitted it, instead of, you know, I don't know. It's like we would have been like, oh, poor OJ. Well, they had, the, gl guy. They had the glove. It was bullshit from day <laughs> one. I'll tell you what that guy did, though. I, you know, like on the first day of the set, because on that film, I run a lot. I don't know if you remember, but oh, I'm yeah. always being chased mm -hmm. in CIA codename Alexa. And, Great and I was movie, like, I have to say again. Thank you. I, I said, you know, Ursula, you're like the greatest runner of all time. Do you have any tips that I could, you know, get for, for running fast? He said, well, I don't know if I can get you to run fast, but I'll, I'll, I can tell you how, well, how you can make it look like you're running fast. I said, really? What's that? He goes, just lift your knees up as high as you can. Bring those knees up as high as you can. And what that does as, as an athlete, you know, when you're bringing your knees up, you're pulling your chest back. So instead of, like, trying to crouch and run forward, like, shoulders down, like, you know who's the best runner? Tom Cruise. He's a great runner. Oh, you forget the Seagal. No, Steven Seagal <laughs> runs like he's got to go pee somewhere. <laughs> and he's, like, running to the toilet. But when you when you bring your knees up, you throw your shoulders back, so your your body's open. So like you just look like you're booking, you know, like ah! instead of like head down, cross so like you're trying to protect the ball. You got to run like you're open. That's why those those running backs that can run so fast with their knees so up and still protect that ball. And that's like that's like an art form. That's amazing to me. There, so. there is an unpublished, uh, and I'll share this with everyone, primarily because I'm talking to you, uh, an unpublished review I did of CIA. There is a published review of, of CIA, Codename Alexa, but the original review uh, I made mention when you are in the uh, jail, uh, in the lockup there in the police station, <laughs> and, you, uh, and you cracked OJ and he pulled the gun on you. I was like, at this point in time is when OJ began to hate blonde women. And then I was like... Mm -hmm. I can't do that, so I had to delete it and change it. So I, uh, <laughs> but yes, well, that, that's good the for you. Behind. You know, yeah, we yeah. all have to have a sense of responsibility when we're writing anything. But um, yeah, that was 
it was it was poor timing. Um, it was it was really crazy. I, I remember Lorenzo and I watching that white Bronco speed down the highway like the rest of America, and we were just like our our jaws, our mouths were just agape. Oh, so was yeah. mine. I was like, this. Oh my God, it's Nordberg. You know, from Police Academy. That's you know one of my. Uh, uh, yeah, surreal. Uh, you know, first in ten. I can't remember his name in that show. It's like, God, I remember that. I've known this guy since I was five. You know, it's like mm-hmm. this is insane. Yeah, it was, and and then we started getting the calls, and I started seeing what a circus it was becoming, and I didn't want any part of it because I knew it was going to go down with with us being brought into it. A, it would look like we were climbing on board the publicity train for promotion, which is a real big mistake because it's not the kind of publicity you want or anything you want to be associated with. And B, anything that we had to say would have just been discredited as like coming from a couple of actors. Who cares? Yeah, because it was actually CAA codename Alexa or CAA Target Alexa, the second one, got more play than the first one. It was almost like that first one was kind of uh-huh. like, let's forget about this one. Um, I own them both. I, I own. I, I would. I'm willing to bet I own ninety percent of your movies. Wow. I, if if not more, I mean. We're gonna have to hook up. <laughs> I I have a copy of Rollerblade Warriors for God's sake. Oh my God, taken by force. Where my mom is dressed as she could, as she calls it, the uh, radish from outer space. It's a great movie, though. <laughs> I mean, it was fun. It was fun. Super campy. Don Jackson. That was really a blast. I must yeah. have seven or eight copies of Bride of the Reanimator, all from different countries around here. I got a leather bound one for God's <laughs> sakes. It comes with a book. Do you know what I just got to do the other day? Was a sit down with Danielle Harris. She's doing a, um, a podcast that is also a video, and she's got like four cameras set up. And what it is is her interviewing the actor while watching the film that they're in and we watched Bride of Reanimator which she had never seen and she's also interviewed Dee Wallace and a couple of other really great uh, Scream Queenie actors and she's putting this whole show together and it was so fun I was just like and I, I gave her a copy of, the, of I Should Have Been Nicer to Quentin Tarantino for Quentin because she's in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood I don't know if you knew this but she's like she's one of the nine ladies. months pregnant, yeah. almost 10 months pregnant. And she, she been friends with Quentin for a long time. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to tell this story because I, I'm, she told it the other day on the show. So it's, I'm, I'm allowed to say it now. It's already been uh, documented. But in, the, in her movie, The Last Boy Scout, that she did with Bruce Willis when Great she was movie. a kid, there was a line that she never got to deliver because it was just too way inappropriate for a kid to say this. And she had told Quentin the line, and he was like, I'm going to make sure you get to say this somewhere on film. And she was like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And and he was like, hey, I want you to be in my movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and you're going to get to say that line to Brad Pitt. And the line is... Go take a bath in my ass. <laughs> and she never got to say it because she went into labor the day before she had that scene. <laughs> so she still never had a chance to say it. She's like, oh my God, I get to say that to Brad Pitt? I- I'm retired. Literally, give me my pension. And, and <laughs> you know? It's awesome. She I'm- knows what I'm <laughs> I'm the one guy that will, because you know, a lot of guys are always like, well, I don't like that Brad Pitt, you know, because, you know, he's a good looking oh, guy. Please. He's so Brad, awesome. Pitt's, Brad Pitt's the man. I mean, he's the man. He is, and he's the epitome of someone who, if you go back and watch also Stephen J. Cannell, he was on a couple of random episodes of 21 Jump Street. He was, yeah. he was horrible, horrible. Watch Cutting Class, like his a great movie. I think it might have been his first film, Slasher movie. He was horrible. Now, you could tell this is actually somebody who was like, wow, you know, I'm going to take some acting classes. And now he's an Oscar-winning mm-hmm. actor. So, Well, then he went to Thelma and Louise, and then he was like, you know, 
rocket to Mars. Let's yeah, go. Um, that's what my wife, I think, fondly remembers him from. My wife did of not course. like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. My wife is, uh, she only likes a few Tarantino movies. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was a very long film for her to sit through for some odd reason. She didn't appreciate wow. it like I did. I watched it three times. I will watch it three more times. Everything about it, I love, love, love. It's not even long enough for me, quite honestly. No. I could watch I could watch four more hours of that, but it's because this is my neighborhood. You know, this is, this is my town. And I, I used to live up Wonderland Avenue. I used to live up all these different places where some really dark stuff has gone down and, and some really great stuff has gone down. And, and that era, that seventies era, it, it reminds me of my mom so much. And, you know that the, he restored certain streets and and hit certain uh, iconic landmarks that, for me, bring bring me back to a place that it is. It will never be like that again. And and the way that he turned it around. So you know you're anticipating something so heinous, but he gives you something even more heinous where you're actually cheering for it to me that is a great storyteller someone who can manipulate you to the point where you're like gearing up for like okay here it comes here it comes and then takes you in such a different direction where you're like oh my god i love you so much thank you now i'm like thrilled to see somebody take a freaking can of dog food straight in the (laughs) mouth brilliant it, I yeah. love him because I have this weird feeling that when he when he went to the studio and was like, "Got a movie, setting it to the backdrop of Manson," and they were probably like, "Quentin Tarantino, Charles Manson, how much money do you want?" Like they didn't even hear the whole pitch for the film, so I yeah. think it was just. I mean, I think they throw money at him right when he says, "Like, so here's the plan," you know, and they're like, "Here's two million, here's twenty million. Oh, you need fifty, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that he he has created a an opportunity for himself over and over and over again. And that's really what it is. That's what this business is. This is not somebody calling you. This is you creating opportunities for yourself. And, and look, certainly, you know, for, for anybody who's out there going, I want to be an actor. How do you do it? Well, you start with learning the craft and learn that craft before you go get an agent or shoot any headshots or anything else. Learn the craft. See if you're really loving being on stage and feeling really uncomfortable and failing over and over and over again. If that's for you, then go for it. Um, but it, it is it is not about, like, I like get in a bathing suit. You know, I need an agent. It's like, no. No, this is a dirty, gritty, soul-crushing business. And you got to really, really, really want it. You've got to really be willing to do the necessary work and steps that it takes. And Quentin has done that over and over and over again. That guy works his ass off. So truly, for somebody that, like, you know, how do you do it? Like, and Steven Spielberg, too. Like, you got to start just creating. You know, stay positive, stay creative, stay ready. Hopefully yes. when I finish my screenplay for Keep to Change about a cop who I would probably have to play myself uh, is so stupid that when he kills people, he gets his uh, smart ass line wrong at the end. Hopefully when I if that ever gets made, that'll shoot me up to superstardom quick, too. <laughs> okay, We'll do it, man. Film it. You never know. You know, look at Justin Bieber. I'd rather not. YouTuber. Well, you can't, you can't, you can't deny the fact that he has created a fan base from some serious talent by putting himself out there. Hey, people and, seem to find me amusing, so I might have a niche out there somewhere. I, I, I don't know. Why wouldn't you try? Even if you didn't have a fan base that thought you were amusing, you know? Did anybody think Quentin was amusing when when he first stepped in acting class? Not me. I would like and, to hang out with him, but I, I can't tell. It's like, would we either be really good buddies or would one of us want to beat the other one up after an hour because we're both so fanatical about movies? 
Well, I think whenever you have a common bond, I think you're probably always just going to get along. And and I'm sure that the last thing you want to do is get into a fight with Brent Tarantino. Well, yeah, that's uh, no, <laughs> the I mean, last thing you, I want to do. One of my favorite movies is Rolling Thunder, and this guy it, that no one has ever watched or heard of or seen, and this guy names his production company after it. It's like, wow, this is so amazing. He also likes Sister Street Fighter. Oh, my God. Then you got to yeah. wonder, it's always like, Hmm, wouldn't it be cool if that was really my illegitimate brother? And then you meet your illegitimate brother, and it's like, oh, it's not Quentin Tarantino. It's just some schmuck. Probably wants money. Well, you know what's super cool is that he has bought this um, old theater in Beverly Hills that only shows uh, 35 millimeter. You know, it's reel to reel. It's a real live film theater. And he played my, one of my mom's very first films, a Roger Corman film. It was her first film called Rock All Night. And I got the call from the uh, theater saying, hey, would your mom be willing to come down and do a Q&A after, the, after we screen it the first night? And I was like, oh, my God, this is Quentin's theater. He's playing my mom's film. This was just like five years ago. And I was like, I called my mom. I said, oh, my God, Quentin Tarantino's uh, theater is going to be playing Rock All Night. Do you want to do a Q&A afterwards? And she's like, yeah, of course. She was 83 at the time. And she just turned 88 over the weekend. And uh, it was probably one of her very last outings um, with the press. Yeah, I mean, we didn't even really have any press. We just took uh, stills. I didn't. I didn't call any paparazzi or anything. I, I kind of thought there would be some, but I wasn't sure, and I didn't really want to overstep. But it was a full house, and she was super funny, and I was just really honored because he has such a, a vast array of eclectic taste, but he has a real appreciation of the originals. And, you know, this was a film that was probably made in two weeks. And, um, you know, and he knows about it and he respects it. And, and it, was, it was a really big night because uh, I was already well into working on the book. And, um, you know, I know I'm going to see him again. And he's got a book that's been signed to him. I wrote on the inside of his book, Quentin. Congratulations, you made it to the cover of a book. <laughs> Do you remember me? Let me introduce myself. I'm Kathleen Kinmon. I'm so proud of you. You know, he's, he's kind of known. And Daniel Harris is going to give it to him. So, you know, I, I think it's just, I think it's really important not only to know where we've come and who we've become, but I think it's really great to appreciate the people that have done it before you. And also make it real available to the people that are going to do it after you. I would I would never discourage anyone from getting into this business if they really wanted to do it because it's a fabulous business. It's tough, but it's not impossible. And I think that if you have the desire, if you have the ideas, and if you have this story that will not leave you, if it's like circling around you like a buzzard, then you need to put it on paper and execute it and see what happens. That's what Quentin did. He didn't go to college, folks. He didn't go to USC film school. This guy was sitting at the back of a very small theater class watching actors act, watching, you know, we were doing scenes from Simon and Simon because we had Gerald McCraney's, you know, the, the woman, Jack Lucarelli's wife, Jeannie Lucarelli, was a, played Gerald McCraney's wife on the show, and Jack was a, was an acting coach. And it wasn't James Best, it was just a theater, but Jack Lucarelli ran it. And, you know, we had, we had all kinds of different people that were very recognizable in and out of that class, and so it was very contemporary. But he was somebody who worked at Blockbuster and freaking studied the classics. I worked at and Blockbuster. You, so there you go. I got you fired. You guys went to the though, same so. school. <laughs> <laughs> well, get fired or quit, whatever. That's at least you were exposed. So. 
Now, I've, I I do have a question to ask you. I'm going to ask you when I stop okay. recording, but okay. I mean, I've already taken up two hours of your time. Okay. And, and I, 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 I don't want to take up any more. I know, i, I got to feed my daughter. I could talk to you for another three, easy. But <laughs> um, where can everyone, I want to thank you so much for doing this. And I want oh, to pleasure. know, uh, where can everyone find you online? Uh, everyone can find me online. Um, my book is on KathleenKinmont.com. And I am on Instagram at KathleenKinmont. It's just me. No Twitter, no so, Facebook. You know what? I have a Twitter account. I don't tweet because I'm too vocal, and I, I don't want to become a Roseanne, and I, there's just only so much bandwidth I can do. I mean, maybe I probably should start tweeting now that the book is out. I don't know. I just don't know what to say sometimes. And I, I, I'm, I'm a writer, so I, I, I labor over my words, and then I'm like, oh, God, an hour's gone by, and I should have been... <laughs> taking my kid to school um yeah i guess i could i probably have to get more into that and on facebook it's really just my friends and my family i i'm like 600 people i haven't i haven't because i post pictures of my daughter on there and i'm you know she's 15 and a half and i just you know i'm, I'm an la person that is very uh sensitive to being um stalked because I have been stalked in the past and I just don't want to put you know I want to I want to keep certain things just a little bit more personal oh I got you and, I understand I don't do a normal Facebook just from my website yeah see I mean I feel like Instagram is really and there's one picture of, of her on there maybe but I uh I don't know I'm it's interesting because I'm I'm very open, but I'm also incredibly private. Well, when it comes to your kid, that's one of the reasons I don't do it. Uh, my kid has never, I mean, I'll talk about him if he likes a movie or something. I always mention him. My kid's name is not given. My kid is not seen on anything or heard on anything uh -huh. I do. He's, But I'll mention him if my kid likes a movie. I don't like that. But, yeah, that's about his involvement in this. Yeah. Yeah, because you know what? They didn't sign up for this. My kid thinks you're pretty. I'll, I'll say that on the air. So, well, I appreciate that, and I, <laughs> you know, I think your kid is really smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think that we need to protect our children. Our our children are their own beings, and we need to really respect them. And certainly now, in the day and age of everybody being able to Google each other and find out where you live, yeah. you know, I mean, my phone number. And address our public forum. Yes. There's no way you can get it down. I've had people because you know, it's already me. too late. <laughs> yeah, if it's up there, it's up there. People are like, I need to get it down, and you're like, Well, if it's up there, somebody's already copied it in triplicate. And the second you bring it down, is the second it goes up five more times. I did so it the right just, way. I, I called your publicist. <laughs> Or you call you called my manager actually you called Chris for manager? management. Yeah, I called yeah. him. Uh, uh, yep, I called him. I uh -huh. think I even contacted your book company. I covered all my bases for this. You one. did, you did. You contacted the publisher and my manager, and I and I appreciate that. And listen, these are the those are the avenues that are going to get the professionals' attention. You know, knocking on somebody's door is going to get a very resounding nine one one call. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, I respect people that, that follow the channels because that's what I have to do, too. If I've, you know, I've, I've, I've made offers to different people by cold calling their agent and not ever cold calling them. It's just disrespectful. And it shows a, a sense of professionalism when you go through the proper, you know, direct lines. And, um, you know, listen, we all, I mean, I could talk about myself for nine days straight, but I also know that at some point people need to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to let you take a break too, Corey. Thank you for having awesome questions, having your due diligence. Thanks for being a super fan and really knowing um, about my career. That really is very, very flattering. It, it, it's, a, it's definitely a rocket fuel to keep me going, so I appreciate that. Say to the, a lot of people might say you're the horror icon. I still put you in the action category. Thank you. I'd like to, you know, I'm, I'm happy in both, and I, I like that I'm still 
um, very physically fit to do either one. So as long as I'm willing to play, let's go.